The church has always been a place where believers find belonging. It is a place where friendships blossom, a place where families begin to form. This is our tribe. This is our family. We belong here. We belong together. Good morning. Glad you are here today. Uh, we have this series about tribe. We started last week. We're going to jump into that. But I do want to kind of point out one of our core values uh, in action. Uh, our very name is named Generations Community Church. And so uh, as a part of that, uh, intergenerational volunteering, intergenerational training uh, is, is just kind of a really big deal for us. Uh, and this morning on the platform, we had that going on. Uh, you notice that last song was led by the gal over here, Pearl. Uh, Pearl is a teenager. Doesn't she sing amazingly well for a teenager? I don't sing anywhere close to that. Uh, and her dad, the guitar player, uh, was there. So you had dad and daughter uh, and volunteering together and leading in worship. And uh, I just, I just want to reaffirm that, that value of our intergenerational, of family. Family matters, amen? Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about that as we get going along. Uh, but, but as we talk about tribe, uh, last Sunday we kind of introduced this, and I know with the snow, lots of people didn't catch it. Uh, but, but one of the things I introduced is the idea of koinonia. It's a Greek word. Say koinonia. Yeah. And, and in many senses, I think that captures this idea. I've been trying to figure out how to say this with kind of modern language, and tribe kind of captures the idea of koinonia, because koinonia is all about belonging. It's all about being a part, and tribe is all about belonging and being uh, a part. And so uh, just kind of to kick us off here, you belong here, you are one of us. We belong to you, and you belong to us. Amen. <laughs> no, not fast enough, sorry. You belong here, you are, not, you, are, you are not one of us, you are one of us. We belong to you, and you belong to us. Yeah, I messed it up there. So say to your neighbor, you belong here and you are one of us. Yes, that, that, that's at the heart of it, this idea of belonging. In fact, the body of Christ, the church, is meant to be a gift to each other. We're meant to love each other and care for each other. Paul in Romans says, we belong to each other other, right? And when he talked about the gifts, the spiritual gifts, again, he talked about they are for the church. They are for one another. They're, they're meant to be shared amongst us. Um, we are designed for redemptive community. And I, I know that message in a modern culture of individualism is kind of grinds on us a little bit. But the truth of the matter is we who are who we are in Christ together. We are the body of Christ. We are a local group. And so um, koinonia is what makes a local church a tribe. It's what brings us together. Koinonia carries certainly the idea of fellowship. That's most often where you see it translated. But like very often, um, the, the original language words are often way richer than the English translation of them. So koinonia certainly carries fellowship, but it carries also the idea of relationship of association with one another, of communion, okay, that kind of connectedness, of participation together, of sharing to, together. Uh, and that is so much richer than what I grew up with. When I, I grew up in the church, right? I grew up in a small church, and I told everybody last week, for me, koinonia always meant eating together because that's what we always did when we'd say, hey, we're going to go have fellowship. We'd have a potluck, right? So koinonia, fellowship, potluck, all the same kind of thing, right? And even when people would get together after church and go out together, we'd go out to eat. There was a buffet in Aberdeen, right? You know, and we'd all go over there and, and we had fellowship. And so that, that's not wrong. It, it's, it's just not sufficient for what is meant by this. Uh, and we talked about last week about how a koinonia is done by the Holy Spirit. The tribe is made the tribe. We are made together uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to see again today how the idea of koinonia and Holy Spirit are very often uh, together in, in Scripture. So uh, I've been trying to figure out how to fit this koinonia, this tribe idea, into our larger understanding of our relationships. And so I came up with a graph. Now this is a preacher coming up with a graph, so don't laugh, okay? 
No, none of the, you know, be, be patient with me. And I don't have Kramer's skill sets for making everything look pretty, but the ideas are here, right? So uh, kind of the first circle for all of us in our lives is a relationship with God, amen? That, that's the most intimate one. That's the most important one. Uh, and by the way, uh, just to kind of rail on against culture a little bit, you cannot truly exist as an individual. You always exist in relationship to God. Now, hopefully, you have a committed, loving relationship with God who you call your heavenly Father, uh, and you're connected, and you're growing, and all of that. But if you don't, then you still have a relationship with God. It's just a broken relationship with God, right? So everybody has a relationship with God one way or another, and that's the single most important one. This is the foundation upon which we build out to these others. So the, the second one is your spouse, uh, that's the second most intimate relationship you have is, is with them, okay? Um, and, and when we know, talk about that, that's the one that lasts after all of this. Now, some people think, well, I have a close relationship with my children. You do, and I hate to break it to you, but as someone that's already there, is one day they're going to look you in the eye and say, I'm moving out, you know? And you will either be like really sad or really happy, whichever one you are. You know, don't tell your kids, uh, unless you're sad, that wasn't good. But, but, but they're, they're going to move out, they're going to find somebody else, and they're going to create a spouse relationship that is more intimate and more connected to them than you are to them. And so your spouse is the most connected one. If we do it right, if we live like Christ would have us to live until death us do part, uh, this, is, this is the lifelong intimate one. And then, of course, the next one is family, right? Your kids, uh, your extended family, all of those, those sorts of things. You know about one another, you're connected. Did you do stuff together? And then the one we talk about a fair amount here is family. Friends who are like family, right? And the really good news is you get to pick your family, you know? You don't get to pick your family. And all of us have that particular relative that we'd just as soon not spend a lot of time with. Amen. Don't say amen. Maybe that's not a good place to say am. But family is what we kind of call our life groups. Uh, these are the people that you have, you have a, a, an intimate, a connected relationship. Uh, all of these, all of this group here is all about knowing each other, knowing each other's stories, knowing what's going on in one another's lives. You, you very often, you know, are praying for one another, you know, when things are going on, all, all of that sort of, sort of thing. So this is all about intimacy and connection. And, and I hope that you have each of these. You need to build each of these into your life. Relationship with Jesus, relationship with a spouse, or maybe, you know, you, something's gone wrong there, you buy your own, but then relationship with family, uh, and then relationship with family. Get in a life group, okay? Now more than ever, having come through COVID, now more than ever, life groups are, are really important. And then kind of what we've been talking about is this next level of tribe. And tribe is a little different from, from the, 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 the family or family or spouse in that it's not as connected a relationship. Maybe you know people's names, you recognize them, maybe you talk to them in passing, but you really don't know a lot about them, you don't feel a deep connection uh, to them. And, and frankly, although it doesn't look like this in COVID, our church is too big for you to know everybody in the church. You just, you just can't, you can't even know all their, their names. Uh, and, and so these are the people you see and, and you care about them. You care about the people in the tribe and you're connected to them, but it's not the same as family. Uh, and if, if something were to happen to them and you were to hear, you know that guy over, th this happened to him this week, you'd go, oh, that's sorry, and you'd probably pray for them. And, and uh, a part of what connects our tribe is we have our, our family prayer page, you know, that's kind of closed, and people will see things on there, and, and they'll pray for them. They'll say, oh, I'll pray for that guy. And you might not even know who that is. You just The, the name was on there as part of our church. I'll, I'll pray for them. Or, or maybe you read it, and there's something you can do for them. You go, hey, you know, I could kind of help out with that. How about, you know, it's tribe. We're connected, but it's it's not quite the same. Or, or our lobby page, you know, a lot of what goes on in there is just connectedness and fun and talking and, and all of those sorts of things. And it might be someone that maybe you don't even actually know who they are. They go to a different worship service than you, but, but you're connected. But, but maybe the most powerful uh, time I have seen a uh, tribe work in, in the church uh, and be really good, really healthy, good tribe happened about six years ago. Six years ago at our Christmas Eve service, uh, we had come through a pack service. There were just people like, oh, when we do our thing where we line up all around and deep and up and down, all the things. It was just a ton of people. It was a really great service. I kind of came out of that going, yeah, God is good, you know? And, and we had a little break between that and the next service. And 
I, I went back to my, uh, to my office to kind of t- take a break and sit down for a little bit and recoup. And, and I saw that, that there was a phone call. The phone rang, and I thought, okay, that, that's weird because it was someone in our church, uh, and, and they knew that this was going on, and that was kind of, you know, but I thought, well, if they call me then, I should probably pick it up. So you pick it up, and Jason Nordstrom was on the um, on the other end of it. Some of you know Jason. He's a part of our tribe. Uh, he keeps our building warm, so thank him next time you see him. Um, and, and, uh, and he called up, and, and there was a strange kind of sense in him, and he said, Pastor uh, Haley, their teenage daughter, has just been diagnosed with cancer, and they want us to get down to Children's Hospital right now. So we are getting in the car, and we are headed for Children's Hospital on Christmas Eve. Boy, did that blow up my Christmas Eve. So I kind of came into the service heavy and and wondering about it, and I thought, do I share this with everybody because it's just going to spoil everybody's Christmas Eve and all of that. And and I felt the check of the Spirit that said, not the word tribe, but that said that we are koinonia. We are in relationship with, with one another. So I did the typical thing I do. I said, Merry Christmas, and everybody's excited, and take a deep breath, it's all done, you know, and then I said, I need to share some news with you because we need you to pray really big. We need you to pray. And I shared with him the phone call that I just have that one of the teenagers in our youth group had very serious cancer, so serious that right then and there they were sending her uh, to Children's Hospital. And man, did you guys respond. People began to pray all over our congregation. They were praying for her. We got updates about it. You began to ask all of the people in the next circle around you, in Christians that you knew, and other churches, other tribes, and you began to ask all of those people to pray, and people kind of stepped up and wanted to help. What can we do? How can we help them? All of those sorts of things. Some of you didn't even know, the, know them. You didn't, you didn't know them. You know, maybe you saw them, but, but that was it. And, you didn't, and, and yet the tribe suddenly stood up. This wasn't a person you were in intimate relationship with. You didn't do life groups with you didn't, any of that. That is koinonia. That is the fellowship, the, the body of Christ being the body of Christ. And of course, if those of you maybe who don't know, the end of the story is six years later, she's doing great. In fact, they lit the Christ candle at, I think, our early service on, on Christmas Eve, you know, and it was a reminder of how God works so powerfully in, in those moments, and the body of Christ was being the body of Christ. We were being the tribe. She was ours. Haley is ours, and, and we are hers, and, and we are family together, and, and so um, it's just so important that you kind of, you, you see what I mean by it's not the intimate, but it's that next level out. And and it's really, really important for the local church to be what Christ would have it to be. We have to have this koinonia going on in the body of Christ. And so the local church is a Jesus follower tribe. That's what we are, okay? We conform our lives to the teaching and example of Jesus, and he is the head of our tribe, amen? Amen. I am not the head of the tribe, all right? I am the gopher and bring the message and all of that, but I, I, I am just the servant of, of that one that is the head of the tribe. And he has lots of other tribes. There are lots of great churches. I pray God blesses all of them, uh, that the kingdom of God would come in, in, this, uh, in this community. But Generations Community is my tribe. And if this is your part of this church, then your tribe as well. It's my responsibility. And our lives are intertangled. Uh, our ministries are intertangled. In a, in a way that, that pleases God and that makes us in relationship. So what I want to do this morning is I want to dig into kind of the character of tribe or of koinonia. Um, and so there, there's a description of this koinonia community, uh, this tribe, if you will, uh, in Philippians uh, chapter 2, verses 1 uh, through 8. So if you have your Bibles, grab them. There should be a Bible uh, in the pew in front of you as well, or you can get it on your phone or however, however you get it. I'll put it up here uh, as well. Uh, and so um, I want to kind of just work through this one. And this first one is really, really important and, and really powerful. Uh, so uh, it says this. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Man, can he pack a lot into one sentence, right? That's just a ton there. So let me, let me kind of pull this apart for you, uh, and, and we'll kind of look at it uh, together. So uh, it starts out with, if there is any encouragement in Christ. So encouragement in Christ is the first 
benefit, we're going to talk about, from the Koinonia community. So, so most of you, you got a job offer at some point, there's a benefit package, right? You're going to get, you know, dental insurance, and maybe you get health insurance, and you get this many days off, and blah, 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 blah. Well, what he's walking through here is kind of the benefits, the benefit package of, of the koinonia of the, of the tribe. So the first one is encouraging, encouragement in Christ. And in the original language, uh, this isn't just a general kind of encouragement. This is actually a, a kind of encouragement that, that talks about uh, exhortation. So it's the idea of brothers and sisters in Christ actually coming along and encouraging one another. And I don't know if you've had this happen, but I've had it happen to me where people will come up and say, hey, I just want to encourage you, Pastor. I just want to tell you this. And I just, you know, and they just kind of build one up. In fact, people have the spiritual gift of encouragement. How have you met, many of you have ever known someone that just, that just their thing, they just encouraged people in one way or another, you know, they just did that. Yeah, several of you have bumped into those kind of people. And that, that's what this is talking about. That within the body of Christ, one of the benefits of the body of Christ is encouragers. The people that come along, and it shouldn't, it's not just left to them. We are all called to build one another up and encourage one another. Okay, that's four of you. Let's try this again. Okay. We are all called to build one another up and encourage each other. Amen. Oh, good. So you all just agreed to the terms right there. That's a good way to do that. Okay. Um, so uh, then the next one is any comfort from love. The, the power that comes from that, the confidence that you have knowing you are loved. Every one of you who are followers of Jesus, you are loved. And if you think nobody loves you, God loves you, for goodness sakes, right? And we love you, okay? And, and, and we are called to love one another. And so everyone should know that God loves them, but not everybody does. But the advantage we have is that we get reminded every Sunday, God loves you. And not only that, but we love each other with all of our perfections and all of our imperfect kind of stuff. Love isn't an emotion. It is a, it is a way of living in relationship with one another. Amen? Okay? You, under, you understand that. And so uh, at the essence and the heart of love is knowing someone's flaws and loving them anyway. Amen? Amen. Yeah, you all should say that because your spouse knows your flaws and loves you anyway. So hold on to that. So um, uh, any affection, okay, which is, which is actually, this is what we're going to do, we're going to geek out on Greek just a little bit uh, here, but I've, if you've ever taken my uh, biblical interpretation class, one of the things I tell you is that some of the emotions we attach to the heart, ancient people attach to the gut, right? So this literally says, if there are any good feelings from your gut, right, your bowels, all of that internal sort of thing. So what, it is, what this is, is good feeling, affection, warmness to one another. We're supposed to be a place where we actually like us, okay? We like one another. We don't like everybody, but we like one another in general. <laughs> wow, I think I need a whole different sermon about getting along with each other here. Okay, so, um, so affection. And then uh, sympathy. And the, the word for sympathy here actually carries the idea of mercy, that, we, that in the Koinonia Fellowship, that in the tribe, we actually extend mercy to one another. Now that should give you great confidence. It gives you the ability to make mistakes, and we aren't going to smack you down. We're going to help pick you up and say, come on, get up. Let's brush you off here and, and get going. And watch out for that next thing right there. It'll trip you up every time, you know. We're to be a merciful kind of gathering of, of believers. And so this is super uh, important to the life of of our, our church, okay? So there's one that I kind of skipped because it's a little different from the others. The one I skipped is participation in the Spirit. Anyone want to guess what the Greek word for participation is? Koinonia. Anyone want to guess what the Greek word for participation is? There we go, yes. So this fellowship, this, this connectedness of the Spirit. Uh, and there's this, this great idea here that, that, that koinonia only happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. You, you can't live it any other way. And that we experience koinonia when we surrender our lives to the working of the Spirit in our lives, right? So this was the benefit package of, of this particular thing, of the koinonia, koinonia in the Spirit that gives us fellowship, that gives us connection with one another, and connection with Him. And that's what healthy church looks like through all of this, this koinonia tribe uh, that we are a part of. It's, it's encouragement, loving, loving uh, comfort, affection, sympathy, all of those are ours when we live in this relationship with one another, okay? 
Oops, let's back up because I want to pick up on one other thing here. Uh, joy of being the same mind, uh, having the same love, being in full accord with one mind. So uh, any affection, sympathy, complete. So my joy being complete of the same mind, and by the way, the word there uh, for mind is the idea of attitude, okay? Having the same love, being full accord, which is actually means working together, this is what the word means, and of one mind. So it's back to that attitude question again, that we would have the same attitude as Christ through all of this, and that we would do the work of the Spirit in loving one another. Now, um, there's another part of this uh, that, that has to do uh, with, with the Spirit and with uh, participation in all of this that I want to kind of get at, because there's, there's things in Greek that you just can't bring out in English, and one of them is, if you'll remember, I've told you before, the word for Spirit in Greek and in Hebrew also means, do you remember, wind or breath, right? Which is why Genesis is so cool, because God, God breathes into us. He literally inspirits us. He puts his spirit in us, which is excellent. But here, get this. You have the koinonia in the spirit. So the fellowship that comes from this living thing. So koinonia isn't another thing like these other things. Koinonia is a living thing. It's an alive kind of thing. And there's this image here of God, that spirit, literally breathing koinonia into you, breathing koinonia in, into me. And it is out of that that we find our life in the koinonia, in the tribe, in the fellowship, in the connectedness to one another. And there's a certain, I have a professor who, who likes to say that, that there's a certain sense in which God breathes us in you know, that he might fill us up with his presence and, and heal us and prepare us that he might breathe us out to be his in the world. What a cool concept that we are breathed in, that we are made alive, that koinonia is a living sort of thing, that we might be breathed out into the world to do his work. In fact, there's a part of that that I want to talk about just a little bit that I, I just see coming out of that, and, and that is this. Most miracles are hand-delivered. Have you noticed that? M most miracles are not what we call vertical miracles. Well, God just kind of comes in and does something that nobody understands. He suspends the rules of creation, and he just does something. Most miracles happen when God prompts somebody in the Koinonia Fellowship to help somebody else in the Koinonia Fellowship. That's the way it almost always works. And the miracle isn't that he, God suspended the rules. The miracle is that the body of Christ was going to be the body of Christ and we're going to do what we're supposed to do, okay? And the classic one, because I just remember this as a kid growing up so much, is that every once in a while I would hear these stories about people that were in really desperate shape financially. Man, if we don't get the, the, the mortgage paid, we're going to lose the house, and, and I've lost my job, and everything's, you know, I, I don't know what we're going to do, and we're all praying for them, and, you know, praying for God to do something in the middle of that life. And they'll come back the next Sunday, and they go, you're not going to believe what happened. I got this envelope, and it had the money. It had the exact amount we needed to pay the mortgage. And we all go, woo praise God. That's a miracle. But you all know that that envelope with the money in it didn't just appear at the post office, right? Some other believer in the fellowship was prompted by the Holy Spirit to go, you need to do something about that. And they got out their wallet, and they took out the money, and they put it in there, and they put the address on it, and they sent it. It was hand-delivered. And that's what the Koinonia Fellowship is all about. It's about ministering to and caring to, for one another. Here's the good news. You get to be someone else's miracle. Amen. And I'm telling you, getting to be someone else's miracle is better than receiving a miracle because receiving a miracle is stressful up until God actually delivers you. Amen? Yeah, it's just like, oh, this is going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. i got to trust God, trust God, trust God. Being someone else's miracle is like, oh, this is so much fun. <laughs> and they'll never know, you know. It is so cool to walk around. That's why God said, don't let one hand know what the other hand's doing. You know, do your alms in private, all of that, that sort of thing. Because that's where the greatness in it, in it all comes. So we are called uh, for this participation, this engagement in, in the life of, of the church. To be of the same mind, to have the same attitude uh, about uh, life that, that Christ has. Okay? So then verse 3. So there's, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, okay, uh, any affection, sympathy, be of the same 
mind. And this is that attitude part that we talked about. Having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. I skipped ahead in my notes there. So, um, so same love, being of full accord, and then being of one mind. Again, the attitude issue. So here's what I want to say about attitude. How many of you have ever worked with someone that had a bad attitude? Wasn't that a fun experience, you know? It's just like, and how many of you ever worked with someone that just had a really great attitude, they just kind of built everybody up, and you, you went away from them going, yeah, okay, I'm ready to do this. You know, anybody out that, you know? Oh, yeah, more of you have had that. That's good. Well, that's what he's talking about here, this attitude, mind. The word here doesn't mean thinking or agreement. We get so hung up on that in our culture. But it means the same attitude, the same way of looking at it as with Christ, okay? Uh, and and so, um, so same attitude. All right, moving on. Uh, verse 3. Uh, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself, and let each of you uh, to uh, let each of you look to not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This is a verse that really rubs on our American individualistic kind of culture. Uh, and there's a really important word in here, and it is the word humility. Say humility. humility. Yeah, it, it's a difficult one for us. Uh, because we live in a world where it's all about, you know, hey, you got to have confidence, you got to be in charge, you got to be the guy, you know, all of that sort of thing. And humility sounds to us like just the opposite uh, of what that is. But the word for humility here isn't about false modesty, which is kind of the way we deal with humility in Alcarts, right? It's like, you know, oh, well, I'm no good and I'm awful and that's all. You know, that's, that's not true. That's not true at all. That's not what it is, you know? Or people go to the other end. I am so proud that I of my humility. I'm just great at humility, right? Which is kind of the other thing. It's like, mm, I don't know what to think about that. So the idea here with this word is that it refers to the idea of recognizing or celebrating the achievements of others, right? So it's being in a place spiritually where when someone else does something better than you, you can go, woohoo, a win for the kingdom. When, when, when you look at what others are doing, you, you recognize that and you go, that is good. That makes us better. That people do things better than me is good for the body of Christ. Yeah, all the staff was like, hey, man, you know, kind of. Because that's just the, the way it's put together. Sometimes I say it like this. A humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less, right? It's just recognizing and celebrating what others have do. So, so we, we do that. We, we count others more significant than ourselves and let each of you look not to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. So here's what I need to say about this. Selfishness is poison, but humility is life. Selfishness is poison, in the koinonia of fellowship, but humility is life. And this is true in any relationship because koinonia is a relationship we have with, with one another. Selfishness always divides us, causes us to pull away from each other. It breaks down relationships. It's the idea of being closed-handed. I've got mine, and don't you dare look at that. How dare you look at that? I'm not giving any of that to me first. You know there's nowhere in the Bible where it says you're supposed to be me first. There's a whole bunch of stuff where it says others first, but there's no place where it says me first, being closed-handed. And on the other side of that, humility gives life. It makes room for others. It, it brings others to the table. It's a celebration uh, of others in, in so many kinds of ways. And, and you, you, you get this, even in your marriage relationships, your relationship with others. If, if your relationship is about being selfish and holding, you're going to have a really hard time in your marriage. You know, but if your relationship is about giving to the other, it's going to work way, way, way better. I, I say this when couples come in and they, they want to get married and they're talking to me about that. I always kind of, well, so why are you going to get married? What makes you think you're ready for marriage? Blah, 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 blah. And if they give me an answer that goes something like, well, I, I just love getting love out of this person. And, and the more love I get, the, the, the better it is. And the other one's like, yeah, and I get lots of love from him too. And, and uh, the more love I get, just the better I, I feel. I'm like, you're not ready to get married. Because if you are pulling something out of that other person and they're pulling something out of them, eventually you'll begin to shut off the pull and then people get unsatisfied so you pull harder and then they, they shut down more and you pull harder and it's back and forth and pretty soon they're in deep, deep, deep trouble. But when they say to me, I want to get married to this woman because I want to make sure that she receives love for the rest of her life. 
that she knows how much God loves her, that she knows how much I love her. And if it costs me everything, I want to make sure that this person gets loved. And so you're putting in rather than pulling out. And when the other one says the same too, I'm like, okay, let's get married. I mean, you two get married, not let's get married. But, but the idea that, that you're ready, and that's the way it works in the body of Christ. When we are all putting in rather than pulling out, it works really great. But if we are all trying to pull out and say, well, that church didn't give me what I want, well, that church didn't give me what, and that church didn't give me what, you're never going to find a church that's going to give you what you want because your very system is flawed. Because you're trying to pull out rather than put in to the midst of it. Selfishness is poison. It will poison any relationship. But humility, that will give life to it. it it's just a, such a, an increasingly wonderful uh, kind of, of part. See? So humility opens the doors uh, to relationships. And there's an interesting thing. We talked about celebrating, you know, that kind of piece that's a part of that. There's so many great theological themes that begin in Genesis. So in Genesis, you remember when God gets done with all of creation. He's done Adam. They've done all that thing. Figured out Adam needed Eve. It turns out guys need women in their lives. So, um, so Eve comes along, and he's done with the whole thing, you know, and he's ready to rest. And do you remember what he said? It is very good. He was celebrating them. And that's that same principle that applies today. Can we celebrate each other more? Can we do more of this humility and thankfulness for one another? Can we do more of, of building one another up and encourage one another? Wow. <laughs> Let me try that again, okay? Can we do more of building one another up? Can we do more of celebrating one another? Can we do more of encouraging one another and be the body of Christ together? Oh, good. That's, that's good. Yes, I would have taken amen, but that, yes, works, works too in all of this. So we need humility, and, and, and we need to avoid uh, selfishness in relationships. Next, it says, humility means admitting, I need you. That's hard. That is hard for some of us because we, we're so independent. And yet, to be humble, we have to confess that I need you. In fact, God wired us up that way. He wired us up in such a way that, that we need to be interdependent. Say interdependent. Yeah, you know what that means? That's not codependent. That's interdependent, that we are created with, with need for, for one another. And, and so uh, God has given us this sense that when we come together, we make the whole. But none of us have us at all. I mean, you see that in spiritual gifts, right? Not everybody has the same spiritual gifts. God gives you a gift, and you a gift, and you a gift, and you a gift, and you're like, well, this isn't enough. Exactly. Because he wants you to come together and share the gifts. It's by design that we are built like this to be built together. So I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, I need you. That was pretty easy with your spouse, wasn't it? Of course, if you sat with your enemy this morning, it was tough, but okay. So, and then this is going to come as a surprise to many of you. It always comes as a surprise to me, and I've been through Scripture a long time. But humility means admitting, I might be wrong. Ooh, silence again. Say, I might be wrong. Yeah, your spouse just got blessed when you said that, you know. It's just, it, there's a possibility that I might be wrong. That's what that humility means, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and you might have a better idea than me. You might have a better understanding about me. That, that, that's, that's, we have different gifts and different graces and different pieces and different parts of it. You getting the idea here? We are meant to be together in, in all of this. Do nothing out of selfishness. Be humble. Take care of others. Do what Christ calls us to do. So, Here's a radical idea. Jesus' tribe is a community of people for whom the tribe matters more than the individual. And this really grates against our culture. Because we live in a world where it's always put myself first. Make sure you take care of yourself when all of that. I, um, a really great theologian uh, that I am uh, familiar with, uh, I think said it really well. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Anyone know who that theologian was? That's Spock, that's right. <laughs> you know, that show didn't get a lot of things right, but boy, it got that one right. At the heart of this is that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. This is why we need the Holy Spirit to do this, because you cannot do this on your own. You have a fallen nature, and you'll go back to selfishness, and you'll go back to my way and all of that. This is suicide if the Holy Spirit doesn't work in our lives and doesn't move. But if everyone does it, if everyone is putting in rather than pulling out, everyone gets their needs met. Amen? Amen. So then, 
Having this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was for in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, to held on to, but emptied himself by taking in the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. This is another packed one that's got a lot of really good stuff in it. Having this mind. Anyone want to guess what that word mind is, what that means? Attitude. Exactly right. Good. Uh, among yourselves... Uh, which is yours in Christ. So everyone's to have it. We all share it. And you can only get it through Christ Jesus, okay? This humility, okay? This attitude of Christ. Who, though, is in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, okay? Let it all go by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of God. Men, okay? The mind is the attitude amongst our, our, ourselves. And then emptied himself to become a servant. Talk about the first step is a doozy. From King of Kings, Lord of Lords, creator of all things, to servanthood. Into the mess that we have made of the world and of our lives that he's given us. And so I love this part. There's a really cool play on words here. Being born in the likeness of men. The Philippians refers back to Genesis a lot. So uh, you'll remember when, when God created us, when God was talking about creating us, creating humanity, he said, let us make man, and that refers to man and woman in the kind of the generous. Thing. Let us make humanity in our image and in our likeness. Let us make humanity in our image and in our likeness. And I'm big on the image of God, right? Uh, and in our, our likeness. So, so look at what he did here. Paul knew that, right? So being born in the likeness of men. So God, who created you and you and you and me in his likeness, when we messed it up and broke it, came and took on our likeness so that he could restore us to his likeness. What a thing, God. Somebody say amen. Y'all out there, hello, 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 you know. This is good stuff. You don't have to like my preaching, but that's good scripture, man. That is really good stuff in, in all of that. Uh, and, and so every follower of Jesus uh, is, is a part of this. And so um, next thing, i got to keep moving here. Um, there we go. Jesus' tribe is a gathering of Christ followers serving one another. That's the heart of this. We serve each other. And when we serve each other, we all get more out of it. Every follower of Jesus should have a ministry uh, to give their life away without thought of compensation or reward. It doesn't have to be a ministry in the church, but, but we should have ways in which we serve others. It's so important that we do that. And people do that in all kinds of ways. In the church, out of the church, we have people in our church that, that tutor in our schools, right? There's no place on my annual report to put that. But praise God, they're building the kingdom of heaven. Amen? You know that? So, can I tell you a secret? There is great joy in serving others. It's one of the most powerful things you can do, that we would serve one another. It will bring you amazing joy. In fact, it's one of the things I say when people are down spiritually and struggling. It's all, you need to get out and serve people. Well, how's that going to help? That's hard work. Uh, just try it. See how God does that. There's great joy uh, in this, okay? And then verse 8, and being formed in the human, uh, being found in human form, okay, that's, he took on our likeness, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. I appreciate that this was put in the scripture, but I have often wondered why, because that's scary, man. And I, I think, I think, this is just me, okay, this is just, yeah, my, my, my seminary professors would have a heart attack to hear me say this, but I think the reason he put this in there is because so when I'm in the middle of doing ministry and I'm serving others and I'm tired and I'm cold and I'm hungry and my blood sugar's low and I'm like, why am I doing this? And I'm weary of well-doing. This comes along and I go, oh yeah, he could have asked me to die. And he could have asked me to die on the cross. I am so glad. This is a good ministry. I like my ministry. There's just something about perspective that helps us, amen? It's just, it's just a part of it. And, and so I think that's why he put that in, a reminder of how much he has done for us. So let me ask you this question. How is your servanthood these days? Where are you giving your life away? To someone who can do nothing for you? Where specifically are you serving? If you're feeling down spiritually, not feeling connected to God, feeling stale, serve. You'll be amazed what that does for your life. It'll lift your spirits and rejuvenate you. Serve. Here's the truth. We can only experience true koinonia when we let the Spirit have control. Because koinonia is from the Spirit. 
And often we don't have it because we're not all in with the Spirit of God. We're not all in with what He wants to do and how He wants to work in our lives. Because when we're all in, it's really, really good. In the uh, book of Acts, um, there is recorded um, a unique perspective on Koinonia. If you remember the book of Acts at the beginning, Pentecost, Holy Spirit comes, possesses these people. There's a rushing mighty wind. There's flames of fire coming from their head. Wouldn't you like to have seen all that? All of a sudden, they go from being afraid to pouring down out of that upper room into the streets of Jerusalem. They're all doing street preaching. Finally, Peter stands up, who had been afraid of a little girl before, and he begins to preach to them. And that day, 3,000 people got saved, and they baptized all of them. I don't even know where they found that much water to do all of that. And finally, at the end of that, we get this picture of what the fellowship, of what the early church looked like when the Spirit of God was controlling it. And so I want to run down through this really quickly. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that is Scripture today, uh, because Scripture comes from the apostles, and to fellowship. Anyone want to guess what that word is? Hey, there you go, koinonia. And to breaking of bread, that is to sharing a meal together. This eventually becomes communion. And to prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Okay? And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing to the proceeds to all as any had need. And this one throws people off a little bit because they think, oh, well, I, I don't know about that, you know. But you have to understand, in the first century, they didn't do a lot with bank accounts and cash. So where they saved was they would buy something. It was hedged against inflation, all of those sorts of things. So if they wanted to give something, now if you wanted to give a significant gift, you would go to your bank account probably and punch in the numbers and do whatever you do, you know. And that would be great, give to the kingdom of God. But for them, they had to literally go sell something. So that's what's going on there. And day by day, attending, uh, day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, he reemphasizes this home connection, life group connection, sharing meals together, again, becomes communion. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. You know what I think represents koinonia? Glad and generous hearts. Glad and generous. Don't you want to go to church where people are glad and have generous hearts? And when that happens, then they have the favor of, of all people. Everybody looked at them and said, wow, there's something going on in the midst of those. The hallmark of the tribe is glad and, and generous hearts. Open-handedness to the world around us. So I want to end with this. Let the Holy Spirit have full control of your life. If our band would come back, we're going to sing together a really great song. Um, the name of the song is Have It All, Lord. You want to experience koinonia? You've got to let the Lord have it all. You've got to let the Spirit have it. You've got to let him have control of all of this. And, and, a, and a, a song is, is, is a prayer, in my opinion. That's the way those work. And so I, I want to encourage you, if you're not there, if you haven't let God have full control of your life, and you want to experience this koinonia, this wonderful song, I know it doesn't make sense. Give God full control, and you'll have a better life. But it really actually works that way. I've experienced it. Many others have experienced. Let him have control of your life. Let him breathe the spirit of the living God into who you are and into who we are as a community. And you'll experience life in Christ in ways that you never, ever thought possible. Amen. Amen. Father God, I pray now that you would open our hearts. Lord, I, I long for us to be a koinonia community, Father. Where, where you are lifted up, where we have glad and, and generous hearts together, Father. Where people on the outside look in and go, wow, there's something going on in that place. I don't know about them, but man, where people love one another and care for one another, where people step up for one another, Father, that we might truly be the body of Christ, that we might be your tribe in this place, Father. We bear our hearts now before you, Father, and we ask that you would come in and cleanse them. We give them to you. We let you have all that we are. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.